Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Khmer's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. Today's episode comes to you courtesy of Evan, who's been supporting this channel as a general tier patron. I truly couldn't do this without the support for amazing patrons like Evan, so again, Evan, thank you so much. And for the personalized deck tech, Evan chose a deck built around Estrid with a focus on land activated abilities. Esther the Masked is a Planeswalker commander that starts off at 3 loyalty and costs 1 green, white, blue. Her plus 2 is untap each enchanted permanent you control. Her minus 1 is create a white aura enchantment token named Mask attached to another target permanent. The token has enchant permanent and totem armor. Her minus 7 is put the top 7 cards of your library in your graveyard, return all non-aura enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield, then do the same for aura cards. So, Estrid can dish out enchantment auras onto permanents that protect them, and also untap those enchanted permanents. Or any enchanted permanents. Of course, outside of her minus 2, we've got plenty of ways to enchant our lands to actually activate our lands multiple times in a turn. And of course, when we are untapping those lands, we can make absurd amounts of mana, and yeah, we've got enchantments that can help us make even more mana as well. And one more thing that I want to mention, every single card outside of the commander is less than one dollar, so it is a very budget-friendly deck. So yeah, this is a fantastic commander for a land-activated abilities matter build, and let's jump into it. First up, we've got some fantastic auras that can help our lands tap for even more like Wild Growth, Wolf Willow Haven, and Fertile Ground. Wild Growth has Enchant Land. Whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds additional green. So for just one mana, we can make a land twice as effective. And then Wolf Willow Haven does the exact same thing, but we can also pay four in a green and sacrifice it to create a 2-2 Wolf Creature token, activate this ability only during your turn. Now, typically, we're not going to be doing that, but in desperate times, we definitely can make that token. Next up, there's Fertile Ground, which also is going to cost one in a green, and it says whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional one mana of any color. So not only does this help us ramp, but it also helps us fix our mana as well. Moving on, we've got some three mana enchantments with Find the Path, New Horizons, and Grafted Growth. Find the Path says when it enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon, which is just some nice additional value, and it says Enchanted Land has tap add green green. So again, this can essentially double up the production of one of our lands. Speaking of which, there's New Horizons, which says when it enters the battlefield, put a plus one counter on target creature you control, and Enchanted Land has tap add two mana of any one color. And then Grafted Growth is essentially the exact same thing, but it lets us choose a vehicle, which in this deck we don't have any vehicles, so yeah, basically the exact same thing as New Horizons. Regardless, each of these are fantastic ways at helping us ramp, as well as helping us fix our mana. Again, instead of a simple land that we have just tapping for one mana, now they tap for two, and again with our commander, we can untap them to tap again, so essentially they tap for four. So speaking of which, we're also going to be running Gift of Paradise, Weirding Wood, and Sheltered Airy. Each of these also allow a land to tap for two mana of any one color. On top of that, Gift of Paradise is going to gain us three life when it comes into play, and Weirding Wood is going to investigate when we come into play. So that clue token just can be some nice additional value that we can sacrifice when we need to for a card. Next up, we've got Verdant Haven, Glittering Frost, and Overgrowth. Verdant Haven has when it enters the battlefield, you gain two life, and on top of that, whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds one mana of any color to their mana pool. Glittering Frost is basically the exact same thing as Verdant Haven, but without the life gain and it's making the land snow. Okay, there are slight differences. The main thing is that it lets us add an additional color when it's tapped. And then Overgrowth is a fantastic aura. It says whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds additional green green. So this supercharges one of our lands and allows it to essentially tap for three mana. And again, when we untap with our commander, that's basically six mana in a turn with that land. Or even more, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. 
Regardless, in a similar way, we've got Dawn's Reflection and Market Festival, each of which have, whenever Enchanted Land is tapped for mana, its controller adds initial two mana in any combination of colors to their mana pool. These are the ultimate ramp and mana fixing cards in this deck. Our land essentially is going to tap for three mana, two of which we can choose whatever we want. And again, when we untap them with our commander, they do it again. And speaking of untapping, we're also going to be running Urban Burgeoning, which has Enchanted Land has untapped this land during each other player's untapped step. Again, in a multiplayer format like Commander, on the right land, this can be massive. Getting access to whatever mana that land gives us, or whatever abilities that land has, can be huge on our opponent's turns. And speaking of land abilities... We're going to be running some more Enchant Land auras like Sunken Field and Debtor's Pulpit. Sunken Field has, Enchanted Land has tapped counter target spell unless its controller pays one. This can throw a massive wrench into our opponent's plans because, well, they have to keep in mind that when our land is enchanted with this and this land is untapped, they're going to have to have at least one extra mana for their spell or we can just counter it. And when I say at least one, well, they might need even more if we've got other ways to untap that land. And believe me, we've got plenty and we'll get to those here in a bit. So even this just being on the battlefield can be a great way for our opponents to have to think twice in what they're doing. And we can also even just use it politically, being like, okay, I won't counter your spell if you do this for me. And speaking of politics, we're also be running Debtor's Pulpit, which has Enchanted Land has tap, tap target creature. Again, with multiple ways to untap this land, we can tap down quite a few creatures, and this can lead to a lot of interesting plays. If we know an opponent's going to be swinging at us with some massive creatures, well, we can just tap them down, and now, well, they're not going to be. Or we can politic that situation, being like, hey, if you're going to be swinging at me, I'm going to be tapping down your creatures, but if you swing elsewhere, nah, your creatures are fine. Or in a similar way, we can work with another player to tap down some creatures to allow their creatures to get through on another one of our opponents. So yeah, this might just seem like a simple aura, but it can lead to a lot of interesting and impactful plays. Speaking of which, a fantastic aura in this deck has got to be Squirrel Nest. It says Enchanted Land has tap create a 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature token. Again, this might only create one squirrel with every tap, but still, the amount of times that we can tap this in a turn can be absolutely incredible. When set up properly, it's not going to take us any time at all to make a massive squirrel army. Speaking of which, we've also got Leaf Drake Roost, which has Enchanted Land, has pay green blue, tap create a 2 2 green and blue Drake creature token with flying. So, though we do have to pay to actually make that 2 2 with that green and blue, mana really is not going to be a problem for this deck. Again, with all the ways that we have to make our lands more effective and the ways to untap them, we're going to have plenty of mana to work with. And again, with that 2 2 having flying, that is a fantastic form of evasion, which can really help us get damage through on a lot of players. Now, as good as these auras are, there's still one aura, in my opinion, that stands above the rest, and that's going to be the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Spawning Grounds. Spawning Grounds is an aura that costs 6 green green, and it says Enchanted Land has tap create a 5-5 five, five green beast creature token with Trample. Again, though this does have a high converted mana cost of 8, we've got plenty of ways to generate a ton of mana in a turn. And again, when you can have lands essentially tap for 6 mana on their own, okay, well, in combination with an aura and our commander, it's not going to be a problem to get to that amount. And again, like I mentioned with Squirrel's Nest, although this can only tap to make one creature at a time, we've got plenty of ways to untap this land and be able to make a massive army of massive beasts with Trample. So it does not take a long time at all for things to get out of hand with this card on one of our lands once we're set up properly. And yeah, we can easily take over the game with our massive army in no time. So for those reasons, Spawning Grounds is the golden pig of this deck. And again, like I mentioned, we've got plenty of ways to untap our lands outside of our commander with things like Voyaging Seder, Blossom Dryad, and Crows and Restorer. Voyaging Seder just costs one in a green and it has tap, untap target land. Blossom Dryad does cost one more and it does the exact same thing, but still, it's going to be well worth it in this deck. And then Crows and Restorer is basically a Blossom Dryad, but with a lot more potential because it has threshold, tap, untap up to three target lands. Again, we essentially have Threshold if we've gotten seven or more cards in our graveyard. And yeah, once we meet that requirement, this card is amazing in this deck. Next up, we've got Lay Weaver, which is a 2-2 Human Druid that partners with Lore Reaver, which we'll get to here in a bit, and it can tap to untap up to two target lands. 
So when this comes into play, we can get that other card with Lore Weaver, and on top of that, of course, untapping two target lands is massive in this deck. And so is the ability to untap any permanent, like with Cure's Follower. So this can untap one of our lands, of course, or can untap one of our other creatures, like, you know, Lay Weaver, which can untap multiple lands. Speaking of which, we've also got Vizier of Tumbling Sands, which can tap to untap another target permanent, and on top of that, we can actually cycle it for one in a blue, and when we do, we untap target permanent. Moving on, we've got Kelpie Guide, which can tap to untap another target permanent we control, or tap to tap target permanent, but we can only activate this if we've got eight or more lands. And then there's Clever Convert, which can tap to untap target permanent, but we can only activate it as a sorcery, and Unbender Tine is an artifact that can tap to untap another target permanent anytime. So yeah, we've got plenty of ways to untap a lot of things, especially our lands, and yes, when those lands are enchanted with the right things, we can have some massive plays. But how do we actually get to all these great cards? Well, we're going to be running some fantastic card advantage spells with things like Factor Fiction, Overflowing Insight, and Emergency Powers. Factor Fiction is an instant that says, reveal the top five cards of your library, and opponent separates those cards into two piles, put one pile in your hand and the other into your graveyard. And then Overflowing Insight is a sorcery that costs seven mana, but it's going to be well worth it because it's going to make us draw seven cards. Next up, there's Emergency Powers, which says each player shuffles their hand and graveyard into their library, then draws seven cards, exile Emergency Powers, and if we cast this during our main phase, we can put a permanent card with converted mana cost seven or less from our hand onto the battlefield. Next up, we've got some great X spells for this deck with things like Read the Runes, Epiphany the Drown Yard, and Mind Spring. Read the Runes says, draw X cards for each card drawn this way, discard a card unless you sacrifice a permanent. So this can be a great way to dig through our deck very quickly, and if we need to sacrifice a few things, maybe some tokens to keep some cards, we definitely can. And then Epiphany the Drown Yard is essentially an X spell factor fiction, but in reverse. Next up, there's Mind Spring, which is a sorcery, but a fantastic one that's going to let us draw X cards. Again, the amount of mana that we can generate thanks to this commander and these auras and untapping our lands is incredible, so we can pump a ton of mana into that X and draw an absurd amount of cards. Speaking of which, we also have things like Diviner's Portent, Commander's Insight, and Lore Weaver. Diviner's Portent says, roll a d20 and add the number of cards in your hand. 1 to 14 is draw X cards, 15 plus is scry X, then draw X. So if we either get lucky or if we've got enough cards in our hand to make it a lot easier to hit that 15 plus, we can get a ton of card selection first before getting that card advantage. And speaking of card advantage, there's Commander's Insight, which says target player draws X cards plus initial card for each time they've cast a commander from the command zone this game. And I did tell you that we get to Lore Weaver eventually. Again, this is the partner with Lay Weaver. And when this comes into play, we of course can search for Lay Weaver. And on top of that, by paying five blue, blue target player draws two cards. Again, we can dump a massive amount of mana into this when we need to, to draw some cards, or eventually maybe to draw other players out too. With the amount of mana that we can generate, which again is an absurd amount with this stack, something like a Commander's Insight could be used to essentially try to mill a player out. And if we get really close to milling someone out, we could finish off the job with something like a Lore Weaver. Regardless, one other card that can help us out in a lot of scenarios is Wildest Dreams, which says return X target cards from your graveyard to your hand, exile Wildest Dreams. This can pretty much get us back everything and anything that we need from our graveyard because, yeah, again, we have a lot of ways to generate a lot of mana, and we can dump a ton into that X and get a lot of things back. But we can also just go get things from our library as well with things like Heliod's Pilgrim, Shrine Steward, and Totem Guide Heart Beast. Heliod's Pilgrim has, when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an aura card, reveal, put in your hand, then shuffle your library. And again, with this deck, we've got plenty of fantastic targets, whether that's auras that actually help us ramp, or ones that help us make tokens, etc, etc, etc. So of course, then we've got Shrine Steward and Totem Guide Heart Beast, which essentially do the exact same thing. Moving on, we've got Open the Armory, which says, search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, put in your hand, then shuffle your library, and Plea for Guidance is gonna let us go get two enchantment cards, reveal them, put them in our hand, then shuffle our library. Again, for six mana, getting two enchantments is absolutely incredible in this deck. And one of those enchantments just might be Oath of Teferi. When it enters the battlefield, we exile another target permanent we control and return to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. But more importantly, we may activate the loyalty abilities of Planeswalkers we control twice each turn rather than once. So this makes our commander doubly as effective and being able to untap all of our permanents potentially twice in a turn can be absolutely incredible. Speaking of which, we can also utilize cards like Alchemist Retrieval, Geist Wave, and Depart the Realm in some very interesting ways. 
Of course, these can all be great bounce spells for removal, but they also can be great ways to return our commander back to our hand to recast her to then activate her again. Alchemist Retrieval says return target non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand, but when we cast for its cleave cost, it's going to take off that you control part so we can bounce any target non-land permanent. So this is either, hey, bounce your commander for one mana or bounce anything for two. Next up, there's Geist Wave, which says return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. If you control that permanent, draw a card. And then Depart the Realm has a foretell cost of just a blue, and it's going to bounce target non-land permanent back to its owner's hand. Again, these are flexible spells that can help us out in a lot of scenarios, and if we're using them to bounce our commander and recast her, again, being able to untap permanence initial time can easily generate us more mana. Moving on, though, of course, we've got other removal spells with things like Beast Within, Oblation, and Aether Gale. Beast Within is going to destroy target permanence. Controller creates a 3-3 Green Beast creature token. Oblation is going to have the owner of target non-land permanent shuffle under the library, then draw two cards, and Aether Gale is going to bounce six target non-land permanents back to their owner's hands. So, obviously, with this one, we can target Estrid if we really want to, and if we can generate extra mana by doing so. Next up, another way to throw a wrench into our opponent's plans, though, is with counter spells with things like Negate, Unwind, and Rewind. Negate's going to counter target non-creature spell, Unwind does the exact same thing, but on top of that we untap up to 3 lands, which of course can be incredible in this deck, helping us generate even more mana, or helping us activate abilities multiple times. And then Rewind is very similar, it can counter any spell and untap up to 4 lands, so again, untapping lands, yes, very good in this deck. Of course, we've also got some Wrath spells that we're going to be utilizing with Sublime Exhalation, Cleansing Nova, and Akroma's Vengeance. Sublime Exhalation has Undaunted, so it's going to cost 1 less cast for each opponent, and it's going to destroy all creatures. Cleansing Nova is a more flexible Wrath that says choose 1 to destroy all creatures or destroy all artifacts and enchantments. And Akroma's Vengeance can get rid of, well, basically everything by destroying all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments, or we can cycle it for 3 if we don't need to. Finally, in our Wraths, though, there's Marshall Coop, which is incredible in this deck. It's a sorcerer that says, create X-1-1 white soldier creature tokens. If X is 5 or more, destroy all other creatures. Obviously, again, with the amount of mana that we can generate with this commander, we can dump a lot more into that X than 5, so we're going to get a ton of tokens and Wrath the board. And speaking of a ton of tokens... Of course, outside of our land enchantments, we've got some other ways to utilize our mana to make a ton of tokens with things like Decree of Justice, Gelatinous Genesis, and Orochi Hatchery. Decree of Justice says create X44 white angel creature tokens with flying, or we can cycle it for two and a white, and when we do, we can pay X. If we do, we're going to make X11 white soldier creature tokens. So this can either make us a good amount of powerful angels, or a ton of soldiers out of nowhere at instant speed, and we draw a card when we cycle that too. And then Gelatinous Genesis is going to make us XXX Green Ooze Creature Tokens, so yeah, a massive amount of massive oozes. And speaking of a massive amount, there's Orochi Hatchery, which is going to enter the battlefield X charge counters on it, and by paying 5 and tapping it, we get a 1-1 Snake Creature Token for each charge counter on Orochi Hatchery. And then obviously we've got ways to untap this as well, to do it multiple times in a turn and make a massive army in no time. Or, you know, we could just win with Wake Root Elemental, which is a 5-5 Elemental that has paid green, 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 green. Untap target land you control. Becomes a 5-5 Elemental creature with haste, it's still a land. With the right auras on one of our lands, we can essentially tap for more than 5 green mana and be able to go infinite with this. We can keep untapping that land over and over and over again, generating more mana every single time we do for infinite mana, and also, you know, being able to untap all of our other lands, so if we've got any activated abilities on those lands, we get those an infinite number of times as well. And obviously, with infinite mana and infinite activations, we've got plenty of ways to win from there. But now that we've talked about every single non lane card in this deck, let's talk about the price. Like I mentioned at the start of this episode, every single card in this deck is less than $1 outside of the commander, but still the estimated cost of this deck is just $32.49, even though the commander is about 5 bucks. On top of that, this estimated cost does include basic lands at $0.10 cents a piece, so if you've already got those basic lands, well, there's some extra savings there. And speaking of some potential extra savings, if you buy this deck on TCG Player, you might be able to save even more by utilizing heavily played and damaged cards, because of course those cards need a home too. That being said, this estimated cost does not include the cost of shipping, so keep in mind that it might vary depending upon where you live. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one. Thank you.